Okay, so we have obtained a so called Lagrange equation. And as I said, this can be extended uh, to, to include things like velocity dependent potentials. Uh, so that's, of course, uh, if you have such potentials, then you can't include them over here, or it could include uh, non conservative forces, uh, then you can't include them on this term. But then uh, for the forces of those types, you just keep them on the right hand side. And, and instead of just doing this in the abstract, I will uh, come back to that when we need it. But uh, those are the two assumptions uh, that we kind of made. And if they are violated, we have to handle them in some way. Right? So the conservativeness is by including it here. The independence of velocity is included here. So, uh, okay. no, yes. So um, I was, in, during the break, I was examining the uh, velocity dependent potential. Mm -hmm. So the book is examples and actually it defines the poten potential like the, the uh, generalized force in terms of, uh, you know, uh, type, like uh, the velocity dependent um, potentials like Lagrangian the, in the same format. Mm -hmm. But um, is it always so? Can we do, can we assume that all uh, velocity dependent um, potentials, you know, within that formulation will give us the um, generalized force because it, uh, gives, it gives the example of uh, uh, Riley's dissipation function mm -hmm. for um, for viscous fluid, for example. But I from from bachelor's degree, I, I remember that uh, it is not always k times v. It may sometimes be k times v squared. There right. is a crit critical period. So when it is v squared, it doesn't it, it doesn't seem like it matches the equation. Uh, it doesn't fit. So I, I, I don't know that that's that's the first answer I should give you. But my educated guess is that you can do this only for a certain kind of potential. Yeah, so for certain situations, so I'm sure you can come up with something not not artificial, just something really physically relevant. That this formula is not going to be applicable, and you have to handle it in another way. The thing is, uh, when you have, you know, these dissipative functions, non holonomy constraints, and so on and so forth, the general problem is not solvable. It's just that there's nothing you can do, and so you have to handle these cases, you know, case by case. That you encounter a physical problem and you try to solve it in a way. Uh, some interesting ones, some physically relevant ones, are going to fit into that formalism, even in the book. Uh, I'm not aware of any anything else. Uh, the, the thing is, my familiarity with classical mechanics is from celestial mechanics, so there's not no dissipation. So dissipation is not very important for us. But uh, in astrophysics, there is this class of problems that take place in disks, and there's turbulence and things like that. But I don't think anybody actually tries to handle them, you know, by analytical tools. Uh, that that's probably because it's not possible to do so. That these formalism like completely fail. So that's my guess. But my honest answer is I don't know if there are such physically relevant systems. I'm sure you can come up with something non-physical that the formalism is not going to handle. My guess is there are some physically relevant situations as well. But an artificial one would not be too hard to come up with. So that the, the formalism is obviously limited. Hmm? Sorry, that, that that that's the best answer I can give. Uh, I really don't know. But we, we can look this up. If this is something uh, that comes up again, we can uh, we can check, like for example, how how those uh, turbulent disks are handled. But I always see them being handled uh, by like numerical means. It's not it's not solvable. Uh, any, any other questions? Anything else? Okay. So we're going to take this equation, and we're going to uh, apply it to uh, one or two problems. So the, in, in the book, there are examples uh, of the you know, particle moving in Cartesian coordinates and particle moving in polar coordinates. I don't think they're terribly interesting. It's also like, very easy to follow. There is no point in you know, copying this <laughs> onto the whiteboard and you copy it down to your notebooks. But let's look at the Atwood's machine. Right? So this is a conservative system. And it's a good example of how to uh, start with these equations and manipulate them. And I'm going to try to stick to the book's notation. So, 
I might differ from. So let me let's write this down. B by dt of partial of L by qj dot uh, minus partial of L by qj is zero. Okay, so this is what we're going to use, and I'm going to write this thing uh, with the understanding that L stands for the difference between the kinetic and potential energy. L is T. Now, by the way, this is not necessarily the only, only choice. So uh, you know how to handle uh, this. You can write down this kinetic energy in terms of your Cartesian coordinates and the potential energy in terms of Cartesian coordinates. And then you can use your transformation equations or uh, some solutions of them to express this in terms of generalized coordinates. But uh, this is not the only choice for your Lagrangian. It turns out that you can add a function or subtract a function of certain properties that has to be like continuous or differentiable uh, in its parameters, and you still get you still get the uh, same physics. Uh, there's some sort of like a gauge freedom that you can uh, you can use. Right? So this is in the book, but uh, again, instead of just discussing it in depth right now, uh, we can we can handle that when it becomes useful for us. Right? Just just keep in mind that this is not the only choice. Uh, sometimes for some problems, another choice is more appropriate. And we're going to handle that. So we have a pulley and two masses. Just to stick to notation, this is M1, this is M2. And we have to find, uh, so this is given as X, and this is given as. L minus X. Okay. So these are connected by a single row over the over the pulley, and uh, there's gravity that's pulling them down. And uh, well, you know what happens here, right? <laughs> the, 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 the heavier mass just goes down, the lighter mass uh, goes up if it starts from rest. The heavier mass is going to accelerate downwards, and the lighter mass is going to accelerate upwards. Uh, I'm guessing everybody remembers how to solve this uh, with the you know pressure level physics tools, where do you start solving this problem? How would you start this? What's the first thing you do? Um, define the forces. Hmm? Somebody said writing, but... Uh, I said know? writing forces. Yeah. Writing forces, okay. Yes. Uh, choosing an origin. Yeah, you can choose an origin. I kind of already chose an origin. Right? So I, I already chose my generalized coordinates. So the, 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 the distance of this from the center of pulley is going to be x. The distance of this from the center of pulley is going to be L minus x, something like that. But you start with a free byte diagram, right? You just take this and then you put the forces on it and so on and so forth. So there's going to be some tension for it over here and there's going to be some gravitational force acting on both of these. But the tension force is going to be upward for both masses. Gravitational force is going to be downward. So you write this down. You set up the accelerations. The net force is equal to mass times the acceleration. And because these are connected, the distance between them is fixed. The accelerations in magnitude has to be the same. Right. And then you just solve your equations. That's how you handle this. Now, how would you do this with the, the Lagrangian? So to do that, you first need to be able to write down your Lagrangian. And you, uh, so here, what, what you can do that you can start this uh, a little bit strangely, and you know, just say that you have a coordinate system like this, and then uh, this, these two have some uh, the, the x coordinates and y coordinates, x coordinates do not change, but I'm going to have some y1 and some y2, and you can uh, try to write all these uh, kinetic and potential energies in terms of uh, y1 and y2. So your kinetic energy is going to be a half m1 x1 dot square plus y1 dot square. And there's going to be the second one, uh, x2 dot square, y2 dot square. And you know, then you eliminate x1 dot because that doesn't change. And then you just write in front of y1 and y2. And then uh, you write down some expression for the potential energy. And for that, you need to choose your origin. And let's just choose this 
here. So this is going to be your uh, y1. This is going to be your y2. So this is the potential energy is going to be m, or sorry, m1 g y1 plus m2 g y2. So you can do it this way. You don't need to use generalized coordinates. And you're going to get some expressions for this uh, x1 dot y1 dot. Well, the x1 that is going to be zero. Okay? There, there's nothing, uh, I think, there. They just remain uh, on the same x coordinate. But then you're going to get some uh, set of equations for y1 and y2, uh, as well as their derivatives, and you're going to solve them. Now, moving to generalized coordinates here is advantageous because there's a simple relationship between these two. These are not independent of each other. As y1 gets larger, y2 gets smaller. As uh, y2 gets uh, larger, y1 gets smaller. In fact, their sum is fixed. Their sum is some fixed number. Uh, it depends on where you choose your origin, obviously. But one way to handle this is that looking at your position this way. Right? So the coordinate of this one is going to be just x. The coordinate of this one is going to be L minus x. So the sum of these coordinates is going to be a fixed number. I, I know this is trivial. I know uh, I'm telling you something that you already know, but uh, this, is, this is the way to approach a more complicated problem as well. Right? So I'm just trying to demonstrate the general method. If you either go to Cartesian coordinates all the way and uh, make your life hard, or you could try to switch the generalized coordinates early. In this case, it's trivial. It's trivial to switch the generalized coordinates. Now, the kinetic energy is still going to be uh, the same. So it's going to be a half m1 uh, x dot square plus a half m2. Well, the derivative of this is just going to be uh, negative uh, x dot, and square is still going to be x dot squared. And our potential energy uh, is going to be uh, m1 g x plus m2 g l minus x. And we're going to uh, put these in. And we're going to uh, write down our Lagrange equation of motion. And so now I, I'll need to raise this. Uh, plus, um, but there's a constant term here that I can just uh, get rid of, it doesn't change the physics state. So it's going to be a one minus a two g m six. Okay. There's an additional term, m two g l, but uh, that doesn't change anything. All right, you can always add and subtract or uh, something. To, yeah. Do we choose our origin to be the pulley, the, the level of pulley, and define uh, our potential accordingly? Uh, yeah, because yeah, instead of y y one and y two, we, we now have well, x and but, but, you know, but by dropping this, I actually shifted my origin, so <laughs> it's it's no longer there. But yes, for this expression, I'm, I'm putting it over there. And uh, if it's, we have our potential, I mean potential zero over the uh, on on the poly, should this potential shouldn't it be mi minus negative? Oh, is it? Because it's the it's the zero level is above above the masses, so anything we write below it must be minus. I I, I don't know. You could be right. It's a. Uh, it's not going to change anything. It's just going to switch between M one and M two. So instead of you know the heavier mass going down, it's the lighter mass going down. It's it's. Mm -hmm. let, let's keep it this way. It could be. It could be right. But that's a technicality. It's that's not. What I'm trying to demonstrate. Of course, it's always good to get the right answer, but uh, I don't want to do that at this point. I mean, if, if, if you make this negative, it just switches and we're an It's not a 
that the physics doesn't change. The thing is, you know, you, you, I just want to demonstrate that this is not, so this might look like uh, something horrendous that you, you could be afraid of this, but it's like partial derivatives and differential equation and so on and so forth. But it's, uh, th there is a, like a mechanism by which you can just write this down. Of course, you have to do it correctly, right? If this is negative, then it's negative. But uh, let's, uh, let's bear in mind, oh, by the way, there is a negative here. Now, you take this and then you write down the partial derivative of this with respect to your generalized coordinates. In this case, there is just one generalized coordinate. So I'm going to write the partial derivative with respect to x. And that is just trivial. That's minus m1, m2 times g. And the uh, partial derivative with respect to the derivative of the generalized coordinate is going to be the derivative of this, and that is just m1 plus uh, m2 x dot. And I need to take the total time derivative of this with respect to that. So uh, let's do it over here to make your lives a bit harder. And that's just going to introduce a second derivative. And this minus that, is zero, which means that this is equal to that. And so x double dot is m1 minus m2 divided by one plus m2 times g. That could be a sign mistake. That's a that's fun. But this is what what you know from uh, from freshman year physics, right? There's going to be some n1g pulling this way. There's going to be some n2g pulling this way. Their difference is going to be our force. You divide this by the total mass of the system. And you get your total acceleration of the system. And as I said, this is just common. This is common for uh, the magnitude, at least, is the common uh, for both of your masses. Right? So the point here is that even though this might look intimidating, it's very straightforward to apply. In fact, in some sense, you think less. Right? You're, not, you're not thinking about what is the force. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, you, you just, you know, you have an expression for aggregate quantities for kinetic energy and potential energy. And you take their difference and you just take derivatives. The tricky part, which was not tricky in this case, is to switch to the generalized coordinates. Okay? You have to be careful about what you're using. Uh, but usually this is going to be, you know, something almost intuitive. For example, for a pendulum, of course you can use X and Y, but I think, you know, you would agree that given the length, the angle theta would act nicely as a generalized coordinate. Just by knowing theta, you know the full configuration of the system, right? If you know your theta and the rate of change of theta, then you know how this pendulum is uh, oscillating about. Uh, and, you know, of course, some of this comes with uh, not this comes with experience, but usually it's not going to be too difficult to come up with a generalized coordinate. And sometimes you're going to be given constraints. In this case, there was a constraint, uh, and in a tools machine as well, uh, and with the tools machine, you can formally go from your Cartesian coordinates to generalized coordinates as well by using your uh, your geometrical relations. But once you do that, the rest is really really not that hard. And as you will see, this allows you to solve some problems that will be kind of uh, difficult uh, with, the, with the Newtonian approach. For example, if you have a double pendulum, okay. can you do this with Newtonian physics? Yes, it is possible, uh, but uh, it's not harder than a single pendulum with the Lagrangian approach. Okay. With the Newtonian approach, it's going to be much more complicated. And you might want to go to something with you know, a continuum, something with a hundred masses. With the Newtonian physics, good luck. It's, it's going to be very, very complicated. With the Lagrangian, it's, it's still trivial. As long as you're using the correct generalized coordinates, and in this case, they would be you know, these two angles, let's call this a total and theta two, it's going to be very easy. It's just some simple sums involving these angles. With the Newtonian approach, uh, can you do it? Yes. I in fact did this for double pendulum. But it's, it's, it's harder. 
And so this does have some advantages. It might look like you know we're complicating things, but uh, eventually there are some problems. You actually can solve with this, but you cannot solve uh, otherwise. Now the third example in the book is uh, a B or J sliding on a uniform rotating wire in a force-free space. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this one. Uh, do you have any questions about this? Now, again, I'm kind of assuming you've seen this before, and it's possible that you did not. I mean, uh, I'm assuming this is not the first time you're seeing Lagrange's equation of motion. But if it's the first time, then uh, this might look a bit mysterious, but you're going to have homework uh, to, to get yourself used to this. But if you have questions, this is the time to ask. Not after I grade your homework. All right. So this is a, the second one, or the third example in the book. Second one we're going to look at is uh, something you know what was going to happen physically, so you heard about. And uh, this is rotating in an axis perpendicular to, uh, to the road, and we have a little beam for a ring. What will happen? You have a rod, and there's something on it, and you rotate this. It will slide off, right? You must have done something similar, you know, maybe not recently, but as a kid or something like that. I have two kids, so I know how kids behave to some extent. <laughs> okay, well, uh, as this rotates, this is going to just go up. Now, how would you, what kind of generalized coordinates would you suggest here? So this is in a plane. You could use X and Y. That's, of course, possible. Your Cartesian coordinates. But, uh, so we use polar coordinates. Sorry, we use Sorry. polar coordinates because the theta, the, the, the derivative of theta, will be constant because omega is given. Exactly. So this is rotating at constant velocity, right. and whenever you have rotation in a plane, uh, just polar coordinates suggest themselves. Right. So th th this will be going into theta and r, and uh, the, the theta part is trivial, right? The theta dot is just going to be omega. So this is really integrable. Theta is just a linear function of time. It's rotating at a constant angle velocity. The R part is, is the more interesting one. Now, how do you how do you write this? Well, you have to write down some kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is normally a half m x dot square, y dot square, but you can switch to all the coordinates, and if this is going to be r dot square plus uh, r square theta dot square. So there's radial velocity, that's r dot, that's tangential velocity, that's r times theta dot, and I just uh, square these up. Okay. Nishe, you don't look happy. Do you want to ask something? No. Okay. Uh, uh, again, as I keep saying, I'm assuming you're not too unfamiliar with this, but uh, if this is not the case, just uh, let me know. Now, uh, this one is trivial. The other one is going to be a bit more complicated, and there is no potential energy here. So our attention is just a uh, kinetic energy. So again, let's write down uh, this part of derivatives. It's L by L. R uh, is going to be L, this uh, M theta dot, right? No, M R theta. Sorry, M R theta dot square. Hmm. Oh. Theta is zero. Hmm. So incidentally, uh, you're going to have uh, coordinates like this, and uh, the, the, this is a called cyclic coordinates. So the, the Lagrangian does not depend on the coordinate, but only on its time derivative. 
If it doesn't also depend on the time derivative, then you're doing something wrong. Okay, if it doesn't depend on the coordinate, if it's not dependent depend on the uh, time derivative of the coordinate, then why do you need that coordinate? That coordinate is for is completely. But sometimes the vibration is not going to depend on the coordinate, as in here, but only on its time derivative. These are cyclic coordinates. What are the what does this bring? There's something special about the cyclic coordinates. There's a conservation law associated with them. So in this case, uh, this is going to be conservation of uh, angular momentum in some sense. Okay. But let's move on. So this L by R dot is going to be a little bit easier. Uh, this is M times R dot. And this L by theta dot is going to be M R square theta dot. Yeah. I hope I got those uh, correctly. So let's erase them. So for this one, I'm going to have D e by dt just for the uh, R coordinate. The R dot equation is M R dot. Minus its derivative is this zero. Uh, for this one, this d by dt, the derivative with respect to dot is over here, and r square theta dot uh, minus uh, zero. Okay. So this makes it manifest. That there's a conserved quantity, the total diamond derivative of this is zero, so this is conserved. And this is why, if your Lagrangian does not depend on a coordinate, there's always going to be some uh, conserved quantity. In this case, it's just uh, something like the angular momentum. Mm -hmm. This is like the uh, moment of inertia, this is angular velocity, so this is the angular momentum of the particle. Now, this one we need to manipulate, so this is M. R double dot minus M R theta dot square, but uh, this is equal to zero. And this one is just omega square, the theta dot. Uh, I'm, I'm rotating at constant velocity. So this is going to be M R square, or let's drop the M's. R double dot is equal to uh, omega square times R. Okay. What's this? Or more to the point, what is this with the negative sign? R double that equals minus omega square R. Harmonic oscillation? It's harmonic oscillator. Mm -hmm. This you should all know. Okay, when you see this, one harmonic oscillator, there should be a neon light going in your brain. Why? This is the only problem we can solve in physics. I'm not exaggerating. Tell me another problem. Tell me a problem that's that is non-trivial and you can actually solve and is actually physical. There isn't one. There's Kepler problem we can solve, but the best way to solve Kepler problem is to turn it into harmonic oscillator, the regularization. Okay. So this is the only problem. What's the solution for this? Science and cosines. Now, with this one, it's no longer harmonic oscillator. Without negative sign, which is what we get here, it's not the harmonic oscillator, and you don't get sines and cosines. What do you get? Hyperbolic uh, sines and exponentials. Mm -hmm. right? In this case, it's going to be an exponential, right? So you're, you're going to be accelerating exponentially, which is actually, if you do this experiment, is very similar to what you can get in a laboratory. Right? If you take a long road, put a ring on it, rotate the road, it starts slow and then just you know accelerates in an exponential fashion. I never did this experiment myself numerically, but uh, in my experience, that's really what it looks like. But this is what comes out of equations. Now, go back and do this with Newtonian physics. Uh, not so easy. The problem is the constraint is time dependent. And Lagrangian mechanics handles this uh, you know, well. This is not so much different from what I did for Atom's machine. 
except uh, there were just two coordinates. But uh, the result just comes out very naturally, very easily. Right? You try this with Newton. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Definitely you can. But it's harder. The more uh, exotic, more sophisticated the problem, the constraints become, the harder they become to handle with Newtonian physics. But with Lagrangian approach, it's, it's no problem. There are things that this, this cannot solve either. So we are going to develop Hamiltonian mechanics as well. But Lagrangian approach is already something very useful. 